Hey, buddy, watch this. Hello, hello, Regis Kilbin is the name, and Hearthstone is the game, and this is my Journey to and Girl budget pirate warrior deck. Now, as many people who know who have been playing in and Girl at all, Pirate Warrior pretty much stayed almost exactly the same as it was from the previous era when we shifted into the new standard format with Journey to and Girl. So there are some pretty good Pirate Warrior lists out there that are still very dominant on the ladder. But of course, this is a budget list, and frankly, Pirate Warrior as we see it today is not exactly a budget deck. It's got a few epics and a couple expensive cards in there that make it a little bit difficult to build the perfect list on a budget. But thankfully, with Journey to and Girl and some new cards like Fish's Fledgling in particular, uh, you can still produce some really big threats in this deck along with some of the cheaper pirate cards that still make this deck playable. So for someone out there who's really absolutely on a budget, and that's who I build these decks for, and has a thousand or less arcane dust to work with, this is the kind of list that's going to do a lot of work for you in particular if you want to play a really fast ladder deck like Pirate Warrior. So again, this is not the kind of deck that can necessarily take you all the way to Legend. It's missing some key cards that you might want to run in Pirate decks that just aren't here. For instance, Patches is a pretty key card in Pirate. You've also got the South Sea Captain, which is another card you might want to run if you're looking to build a full-on Pirate deck these days. Here's South Sea Captain, for instance. But, you know, that's an epic. It costs 800 dust to get two of those. That's fairly expensive. And frankly, you can still get by with the substitutions in this deck and play this deck really well on the ranked ladder, probably up to rank 10, perhaps even beyond, simply because this is a really fast deck that can accrue wins quickly, can help you find win streaks really nicely, and shoot you pretty far up the ladder, even if you're brand new or on a strict budget. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the cards in this list and what makes it a Pirate Warrior. Of course, Pirate Warriors as an archetype are looking to really just do damage to their opponent's face. You only really trade when it somehow sets you up in a favorable way to do more damage in the future. For instance, killing a minion with your weapon so that you can protect your own minions in the following turn. But at the end of the day, you still have to do tons of damage. And there are just a lot of tools in this deck to do that. Sometimes via weapons, of course, even starting with the one drop Nazos first made to give you a small weapon, rolling into Fiery War Axe, and then finally finishing it off with Arcanite Reaper. And then tools to actually buff those weapons or synergize with those weapons. For instance, Blood Sail Raider gaining attack from your weapon, South Sea Deckhand gaining charge from your weapon, uh, Blood Sail Cultist buffing your actual weapon, and the Naga Corsair also buffing your weapon. And then finally, there are just some other damage minions that are either chargers or just high tempo plays like Corcron Elite just for charging damage. Nightblade is a card you don't see often but it is a basic card that's a good curve topper for this deck that does three unavoidable damage and that's always nice because sometimes your opponent will set up that last final taunt and you just can't get through it but Nightblade could give you that last little extra reach that you need. This deck also runs Wolf Riders for extra damage almost as the second Corcoran Elite essentially and then other things like Heroic Strike too just to hammer your opponent in the face. And then finally, as far as the Unguro cards in this list and what makes this really an Unguro deck as opposed to another deck, there's only two here, but I think they're both actually rather important. The first of which is Firefly. Now, this might seem surprising to people because this isn't an elemental deck. It's not a token deck where you benefit from small minions like this. But you'll be surprised how often Firefly is the kind of minion that you just throw out there it gives you, of course, a resource in hand with another one drop, but it'll just linger. It'll stick there. It'll give you ways to fill out your curve. In other words, you know, you might want to play Fiery War Axe on turn three, but you don't have another one drop. Firefly or the Battle Cry minion that it provides you are the perfect way to just get some extra stats onto the board. It can ping off little tokens to preserve your one health stuff like South Sea Deckhand. It can get a few points of chip damage here and there because... Two attack or two health minions are sometimes just surprisingly hard for opponents to deal with if they only have pings to kill smaller stuff in general. So this is one of those just curve filler, curve smoother sort of chip damage kinds of minions that seems like it wouldn't fit necessarily into an aggro deck because it's only one damage, but nonetheless actually can do quite a bit of work 
because you never know when you just need to line up some numbers perfectly and this thing smooths everything out. The other go card on this list is Vicious Fledgling here at the three mana spot. Now, traditionally here you'd see Frothing Berserker, which is a great card to run here too. And frankly, if you have Frothing Berserkers around already, you can cut the Vicious Fledglings for the Frothing Berserkers. They serve the exact same kind of purpose in this deck. They're one of those really high value threats that your opponent has to address, or they can just snowball out of control. The reason I included Vicious Fledglings in this list instead of Frothing Berserkers is really quite simple. It's because this is a Journey to Unguro list. And I think a lot of people out there who are building budget decks right now are doing so after opening Unguro packs. So I think you're more likely to already have some Vicious Fledglings laying around, thereby probably saving you some dust in the process. Plus, if you're building other Unguro budget decks, this is the kind of card that might fit, for instance, in a Token Druid or a Beast Hunter and still give uh, additional synergy. So it's a neutral card that goes farther than does a class card like Frothing Berserker. If this is the only list you're looking to build and you only want to play Budget Pirate Warrior, I might recommend instead that you play Frothing Berserker instead of Vicious Fledgling just because it's probably slightly better in this list, just less of a useful card to craft in general for people on a budget at this point in your growing Hearthstone collection. But ultimately, still, again, just a three-drop threat that your opponent has to answer or it will dominate them in the long run. And frankly, Vicious Fledgling is a little bit more flexible than Frothing Berserker. Sometimes you can use it to tank some hits if you give it taunt or give it extra health. If it gets Wind Fury, it becomes really scary. And it's the same kind of card, but I think in budget decks, you need a tad more flexibility and sometimes more specific answers. And Vicious Fledgling has that potential that Frothing Berserker doesn't necessarily have. So, all that said, this actually sums up the list. That's pretty much every card. And I think the best way to learn it beyond this point is very simply just to take it out onto the ranked ladder or maybe just the casual ladder in this particular instance to see it in action. And the reason I say the casual ladder this time around, if you can even call it a ladder, is because I have climbed all the way to rank three at this point in the season. And again, I mentioned this deck is not designed to carry you all the way to Legend. And I don't know that we're going to win a ton of games at that rank. In fact, we might lose some if we were to play at that rank. And I don't want to tank my laddering success this month just yet. So I think I'm going to play this deck in casual instead. It should still give us some very competitive games. And we should still see some top tier decks and normal opponents. So I think it'll still give us a good measure of what the deck can accomplish. And I'll still be able to walk you through the mulligans and the lines of play, etc. Without actually risking my climb. Because this is not a legend deck. This is a budget deck. Playing it beyond rank 10, you might find some success, but don't expect a ton of it necessarily. So you have to be careful, and I do want to guard your expectations a little bit, and certainly not risk my own laddering uh, playing a budget deck on the ranked ladder when I'm trying to hit Legend this month, which is uh, sometimes a rare occasion for me, but I do want to actually grind it out. And a few stars here and there do start to add up when you play a lot of budget decks like I do. So as far as the mulligan is concerned, uh, we're definitely looking for our one drops here. Uh, the priority being Nazoth's first mate, South Sea Deckhand, Firefly. Uh, these are both pretty solid options. Without patches, you know, hitting a pirate on one is not quite as vital as it might be in a traditional budget or a traditional pirate warrior deck. Um, so we're, we're fine to play the Firefly here just for curve considerations. Um, hitting a weapon would be good to give this charge, it's going to be a better minion with charge. Shaman can be a problem just because they do have a lot of different kinds of board clears and stuff. Uh, we have a lot of weapon synergy cards right now, but no weapon. So that's our biggest downfall at this point. Is he actually going to make this trade? Very interesting. He just went two for one there. Uh, in that case, I think we'll just go ahead and play these out on curve. Even if we don't get to benefit from the charge, it's still just stats on the board. He made a pretty inefficient play last turn. That, that to me signals that he doesn't have a lot of catch-up mechanics. Wow! Or he has Forked Lightning. That's kind of crazy, actually. Whoa. Um, all right. So I'm very surprised he made that previous play with the Bluegill Warrior if he was going to Fork Lightning our board anyway. Because that kind of signaled right that he was scared and playing from behind pretty significantly. And uh, that usually means you don't have a Lightning Storm. Because if you have a Lightning Storm, you kind of save your resources and wait to kill everything at once, right? Or if you have a Forked Lightning, for instance... Uh, but, but that is a very unusual card. Thankfully, we're going to get some pretty big stats on the board and finally start hitting this guy in the face, 
which of course is at the end of the day our ultimate goal. These cards are a little bit flat right now though without a weapon. We need to see a Fiery War Axe, an Arcanite Reaper would be fine on five. Take an Azoth's first mate even, because it'd be a fine curve. But we do have a lot of damage with our board and Heroic Strike, so we're going to chip away pretty quickly at this guy's health if he doesn't resolve these minions. And you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to save these cards. If you, if you can't get the buff, sometimes you just got to play them out, right? Get the stats out there. 3-4 three, for 3 is still a pretty solid play. Now that's kind of big and scary, right? But it's actually a little bit slow um, for our board. Because he can only trade that into a single minion at a time. And I'm going to play this Naga Corsair down, and it's it's absolutely going to die to the Flame Wreath Faceless. But it does something, it discourages um, a Lightning Storm, right? Because these, these things all kind of have 4 health, and it, it's going to be hard for him to do anything with Lightning Storm. So he's probably going to have to trade this in and make some other suboptimal play. If he plays like uh, Feral Spirits, we can do some pretty cool trades and probably still squeeze damage in. We're just sort of ignoring this minion. It just doesn't do enough for us to care. That 1-1 one -one Taunt is actually sort of annoying. I would love to see an Azoth's first mate at this point. Would save me a lot of trouble. Whew. That's a great, great draw. I think we'll go wide. And I think we'll just go face, guys. It's uh, we have he's down to nine. This thing gets to make some trades. Lightning storm and stuff hurts a lot here still, granted, but we have five damage in hand and so many chargers and so much unavoidable damage. And uh, I I don't exactly know what kind of deck this is. It seems to be just running a lot of weird cards. Granted, I don't know that this is the best deck I've ever seen. That's an odd play, not necessarily though, I guess. If he's trading, it, it doesn't really matter. It's going to fall in anyway. I don't think that's going to be enough to keep him up here. Just a lot of damage coming down. That's way too slow. Uh, he's, he's just super dead now. No mana remaining. We have we actually have 8 damage on board. And clearly we have lethal in the end. So. And we top decked super lethal. Don't even need our minions. Well played. So I'm not really sure that was the best. The best matchup. I don't. That was not, you know, a, a, a high tier deck that I've ever seen lately on the on the ladder. So that might have been a little bit of a freebie, but still, you got to see the deck in action. We got to talk about some some mulligan decisions and some gameplay lines too, because we we certainly did not have a perfect opener at all. We didn't have a weapon until turn six, I think, and even then, it was a bad weapon. So it wasn't the perfect curve for us. And he actually had a surprisingly efficient opening in as far as removal was concerned. He dealt with our early stuff, but we were still able to just piece together enough. He kind of fell flat there in the mid-game. This looks like a much better opening here. Uh, we don't need two in his off first mates, and the Dread Corsair is really better with the big weapons, so we don't need to keep that. We're looking for the other small cards to play alongside this. Uh, Firefly should be fine. Just helps me get stats. This is a, this is also a card that's a good counter to pirates, right? Because it trades into this little one one stuff and denies the weapons and things itself. So that's a, another interesting uh, advantage to Firefly. So we we could have saved the coin here, right? Because we're gonna have a little bit of an awkward curve on two. Maybe we might just play a flame elemental, but we're very likely to draw into a two drop at this point because we have a lot of our big cards in hand. We're much much more likely to draw into something playable than not. Uh, not to mention, it's just good to get these stats out. It, it, it seems like this might also be a budget pirate warrior, actually, because he doesn't have uh, patches. He didn't summon patches on his pirate play. If he just trade hero powers here, I think we're in a really good spot. Even just playing the flame elemental will be fine. I would expect to see, like, a raider here, though, if I was going to guess. Another in his first mate. That's fine, too. We can just trade into that with our weapon. Emerald Reaver, never mind. We'll obviously trade into that with our weapon and then trade this way for the favorable trade. And unfortunately, as we feared, we did not draw into the two drop, hit the three drop instead. But we'll still be fine. We have the board. He's actually lower on resources than us, not to mention we have better minions in general. The Vicious Fledgling here should stick and create a pretty monster threat. Uh, but let's just see what he does. He could play a Frothing Berserker that'd give me a little bit of trouble. Fiery War Axe is not bad. He's just overlapping weapon after weapon. He had a fairly awkward hand here for the, for the weapon draws. It does, unfortunately, kill the Vicious Fledgling, though, is the issue. So I, I think we'll go ahead and burn that weapon charge with the Dread Corsair. And um, 
hope to stick this or maybe just hit the Naga Corsair next turn and save this for a little down the road, right? We don't want this to die for free with stuff we can see on board. This is the kind of asset that is game winning if you save it and utilize it later. This is another bit of a non-optimized deck. I'm afraid we're not getting the best viewing experience here, but at the end of the day, it's okay. So here, we'll just make this trade. Like I said, uh, you only really trade in this deck when you can preserve an asset, but it, it's likely that that 3-attack minion could have perhaps killed this Naga Corsair. So trading into that helps preserve this guy, uh, which is really important. Right? He might have Heroic Strike or some other way to kill this. Uh, we are engaging in a race at this point, unfortunately, which he has a lot of damage, so... Ooh, <laughs> that's a good draw, folks. Um, and that's why it's in the deck, right? It's just one of those basic cards, tech cards. This has sometimes been ran in just real Pirate Warrior, a full version Pirate Warrior 2, just as a tech for the mirror match and just other weapon classes, right? It's not the perfect card of your choice. Whoa! Now that is not a normal Pirate Warrior card to see. Thankfully, we rocked on the five the five drop here, so we're good to go. Uh, we can go ahead and play the, the Reaper here, and some people might ask, why not play the minion? Uh, that's because we know he doesn't have a taunt right now, and we can get this guaranteed damage through. Uh, if he does taunt next turn or something, the Nightblade will work through the taunt, right? And that means we can maybe send a weapon in and Nightblade for lethal. If we did it the other way around, um, it, it may not work out as well, right? Because... This would have to maybe attack through a taunt, and then we'd be stuck with the Reaper. It, it, it might not matter, but sometimes it could. Usually, if you have damage that goes through taunt, use it later than damage um, that doesn't go through taunt, because you'll get stuck. And uh, this should be should be lethal, yeah. We have five and three. All right, cool. So we're rolling so far. I mean, again... Not, unfortunately, getting the best matchups in casual mode as far as uh, high-tier decks. I thought we'd see a little bit more uh, regular stuff. These seem a little bit more like homebrew, sort of just casual decks. But, that said, I think you can still see the internal consistency of our deck is there. It's, it's playing smoothly, it's doing what we expect it to do, the minions are working, we're still learning, so. Still a good little experience. Another warrior. Is this the same guy? Nope. Okay. South Sea is typically not necessarily great in the opening hand, but when we know we have Nazoths and we can coin into the South Sea, it could be very strong. So we'll we'll hold this. Uh, these two are a little slow for what we need to do. I'd really like to see a two-drop Raider and a three-drop Cultist. That would probably be the perfect hand at this point. Another person without patches. We're playing like all budget pirate warriors today. It's very interesting. It's not what you normally see. Fly, Polly. Now this this deck hand is is probably gonna die to his weapon, right? But he does take four damage from it and it wastes a weapon charge and helps protect our first mate. So we do have some pirates on the board and some potential advantages. Uh, we'll likely play the uh, War Axe next turn, if he, especially if he plays like a Raider or something that can kill it. Or that this can actually kill. Oh my goodness, that's a play. That is a bit of a problem, guys. That's a bit of a problem. The pirate counter here. Um, Alright, I think we gotta do this. As much as it hurts me to take that much extra damage here, um, we have to we have to be able to kill this. And this uh, gives me the Dread Corsair cheaper next turn. So we'll see. Hopefully he whiffs on this turn a little bit. Oh, he does have patches. It's just in hand. So that's, that's a good sign for him. That he's not a budget player. Uh, I'd really love to see a 2-drop to help me with this Dread Corsair here. Otherwise our turn's going to be fairly flat. Like I said, fairly flat. I think instead... Um, I think I'm just going to play this Fledgling. It's going to die to his weapon trade, right? But uh, it does set me up for a Dread Corsair Bloodsail Cultist turn 4. Which is pretty sick, because it buffs my weapon, right? So, uh, as much as we can value this resource, typically, today, I think we have to sacrifice it just for the better play down the road. Uh, developing the taunt's going to be important, too. Is he going to try to save his health here, or...? 
Hey, he's saving his health and his weapon. Now that is interesting. With 27, I think... Oh, he used the weapon too. Wow, I don't think I would have made that line for the record. Alright, and we have to go ahead and use these charges because we have two Arcanite Reapers in hand, right? We want to get through these charges. Uh, and four face damage is not a waste at all. It's still a great plan. Hopefully he's just stuck on a minion here, like a, a Naga Corsair or something. And I can just kill it and play another weapon and go face. Uh, going down to nine is a little scary, admittedly, but still. Sometimes you gotta do it. He didn't develop anything, just cleared my minion. That's a really good sign for me. Oh my goodness, I think we have to go for this. It's just, uh, it allows me to armor up, which is actually kind of valuable at this point. And uh, it basically gives me an Arcanite Reaper for free. We just have a ton of damage right now. So we have uh, 11 next turn, plus theoretically 20 damage in hand, right? We're just going to take a while to get it out. So we got to make sure we live long enough to play all this stuff. But having the minion advantage on the board is definitely the, uh, the way to go. So, okay. I don't think that's lethal yet, right? That's 9 plus 5 is 14. We're too off lethal. But the reason we're playing this and not the Reaper is because we'll still be able to Reaper next turn, but we need the Hero Power to try to live through this turn, right? Because um, he can Mortal Strike, Heroic Strike. He can do a lot of ways to get to 13. It's certainly possible that we're dead. Uh, Leroy Heroic Strike kills us. Uh, Mortal Strike Heroic Strike kills us. Dread Corsair does not. Naga Corsair does not. Blood Sail Raider does not. So we have Lethal here. Cool. Alright, that's a pretty good matchup. That was just a legit Pirate Warrior, I think. And we even we even lived through the Galaka Crawler counter, which is like the perfect tech answer, right? Uh, he had a little bit of a flat curve after that, but it looked like he had some resources in hand that he just wasn't playing. So I'm not sure what the deal was there. I'd have to re review those lines of play to see why that made sense. But uh, still, we won the race. Perfect run so far. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. Beating some decks here. I'd like to play maybe one or two more games. I mean, there's only so much to see, right? <laughs> like, we've already seen quite a bit. The games go fast, admittedly, but... I don't think we can keep the deck hand here without knowing that we have an early game weapon. Uh, I think we need a mulligan for some, some faster stuff. If you had patches in the deck, I think you could. Just because it would guarantee you summon your patches on one. You could just play it as a 2-1. In this deck without patches, I don't think that's nearly as inefficient of a play. So instead, we're going to just dig. We got a terrible re replacement set here. Like These are just so slow. Uh, really, really slow. Good cards, but slow. I mean, two of the best cards in the deck... But slow. And we don't have a two drop yet either, so we may be able to play the flame elemental just fine. But if he plays like a tide collar, uh, we don't have a way to kill it yet, so that could be a major issue for us. We'll go ahead and play this because we got to get the minions out. The hero power is probably not relevant. These wolf riders are not your best three drops. You want these to be finishers, right? They just die too easily to play on curve. It's not the ideal. You know, compare that to the cultist as the three four, right? It's not the perfect drop. Um, so we'll just develop this here and not trade. This doesn't trade very efficiently on his turn, so uh, he, he can't coin out a true silver to kill this. So there's a chance we can maybe draw like a war axe, get through that, and send the fledgling to face, right? And that's the real value of the fledgling is getting it to attack face so that it can snowball out of control. Worst case, we can actually wolf rider and do the same. It's not quite as efficient, so I'd love to see the war axe. Although even that would leave me with two spare mana, so I'm not sure it would matter too much. He probably doesn't have a great play here. Because he coined out the Tar Creeper in sort of desperation, it seemed. He might just be hero powering. Good Aldor. Oh, well, why would you wait so long on that? That's an incredible play. Why would you even hesitate? My goodness. Um, so... We, we have to do the same play to this now, though. And we can just leave this sitting still, because, you know, he might True Silver at this point, which would suck. We're going to be behind at that point. But we can Arcanite to get through the taunt and then start going from there. It's going to be hard to catch up, frankly, because the two 
insane three drop taunts, you know, three mana taunts, is uh, pretty much the nightmare scenario for me. Blessing of Might on the Tar Creeper. Now that is not a play I expected. I'll give you that one. Huh. You see some interesting stuff in casual. Huh. And Dire Wolf Alpha. I do not know what this is about yet, guys. I gotta be honest. Um, we'll just Argonite Reaper that taunt. It's not very efficient, right? Uh, we took a ton of damage, and uh, but we don't want a minion to die to it, necessarily. This is the kind of thing against Paladin. They don't have pings, so the one health on this Wolf Rider could actually make a fairly significant body on the board. They we're kind of taking the slow route here, so some weapon buffs would be really, really important for this deck. Or for this matchup, I should suggest. Um... All right, that's a great, great drop. The question is, what do we want to play alongside it? I think I'll just weapon face and play the other Arcanite Reaper here. Um, we could Arcanite Reaper the Wolf so that the Dread Corsair is likely to live, I suppose. And just play the Naga Corsair. But that's a lot of resources going into... Um, Alternatively, I suppose we could just play the Nightblade and use the Naga Corsair on a future turn after we develop the new Arcanite Reaper. So let's just do that, right? Let's just do this. I think this is fine. Uh, just killing this to protect the taunt body, right? Again, we've we've basically used 10 damage to kill 4 health, which is really bad for this deck in general. But if it's protecting this asset that has a chance to live for a few turns, that'd be great. We we're, This is probably going to get like randomly Spike Ridge Steed buffed or something, and I'm going to regret it. Because it'll make a pretty efficient trade. But uh, we, we kind of have to try to play towards our outs a little bit in this game. We can just uh, Arcanite Reaper again. <laughs> and even play the Dread Corsair again. Same story here. I think we'll go ahead and make this trade. Plays a little bit into Consecration. Uh, we're we're going to lose this game most likely just to be clear. like Just so people understand. I don't necessarily think I'm going to win... But we, we certainly have to try, and we can squeeze together some insane damage in this deck. It's just, that turn 3 taunt into the another turn 3 taunt was just backbreakingly good for us, like, uh, for him, against us. We can't handle that kind of play. Yeah, there's the Consecration. Pretty much everything I've called that would be the worst imaginable scenario has happened each turn of the game thus far, so that's never fun. But even now, like, we can do 9 damage immediately this turn. And, and we will. I'm just going to go for it here. We, we have to turn the corner and try to do some damage. He's got a great trade here. This is kind of what I was talking about with Wolf Rider. It's risky. They don't traditionally have a ping, but this is basically the Paladin ping, right? But I have nine more damage in hand. Uh, could put him to eight, potentially. But uh, Tyrion's going to shut me out of the game, of course. And that's likely to see on eight. Hammer of Wrath? A little less likely to see. But a good answer, nonetheless. Might mean this lives. No, we're going to see a Consecration. Number two. So I need a big minion here or something. Fire War Axe actually. Damage, it works. We'll save this heroic strike. Just in case I have to get through a taunt or something, another spike rich steed. This gives me exactly seven to get through a steed, so. It, again, a steed locks me out of the game, so it's probably not something that matters, but it's it's relevant, and this will likely because if he ever plays a taunt, we lose no matter what. So it doesn't matter to squeeze this in while there's no taunt. Well, we might be able to get through that taunt in particular. One thing we have to worry about is our own life, too. We're at 14. He has 9 on board. So we might be dead very soon if we don't armor up. That's 8, 9. We're at uh, 13. We can go to 15. So that put us out of range of true silver lethal. Uh, second heroic strike here does not win me the game. We don't have any card draws, so we're pretty much top decking for lethal at any given point. Uh, if he does True Silver now and attacks, he will be in lethal range next turn. So that's one thing. Not to mention he'll heal, which will suck. Yeah, so that, that'll be lethal next turn. I, oh, but he didn't attack, so it actually won't be lethal next turn. Interesting. 
And he didn't heal. I can't imagine not a reason not to attack there. Because then he's 8, 9, 13, and we're at 15. I think that was just a mistake, unless there's something we don't know about yet. But basically gave me another turn to find it out. Can't cast Spike Ridge on that. It's not able to be targeted. He has to cast it on this. If he does, the game is over, so it's over. Oh, Blessing of Kings. That's lethal. Yeah. He didn't know he had that Blessing of Kings, though, when he equipped the True Silver, because I think that was the top deck. So, I think it's still a, perhaps a misplay, unless he had something else here to, to put him over the top that we didn't see. Alright, let's play one more. We saw what a loss was like. Pretty much countered every every turn with the worst possible scenarios. But we still, I mean, we had some outs. We had ways to win in the next turn or two. We, we had him down to, um, what, 11? 12, maybe 13 with the True Silver attack. I don't know if we had a single out or not, but... We still put ourselves in a position to compete, which I think is the important distinction here. Oh, pretty bad hand here. We need to find some minions. Heroic strikes are finishers, not uh, openers. All right, this is we can work with this. It's not perfect, but uh, Nazoth is pretty much your best possible one drop. So hopefully we don't see a Firefly right off the bat that kind of counters this. That would be a little bit frustrating. Uh, and if this does live, we can actually just coin the Blood Sail. You'd rather hit this buff on some bigger stuff, of course, but still, two damage against Shaman is actually a pretty magic number. Not to mention you just kind of get to put this out sooner. Since this dies, there's no incentive to play the Blood Sail now. I'd love to see a two drop. Uh, Fledgling is actually something anyway. We can do that. He doesn't show anything to kill it right now. He can probably Lightning Bolt or some other magic way to kill this, right? It's, it's likely dead, but it's still something to play. And it might live. Or he might just not have it. He's only got two damage right now. Maelstrom Portal kills it. Lightning Bolt kills it. Looks like Maelstrom Portal to me. Not the most efficient Maelstrom Portal history. Wow, he didn't have it. Okay. So now we're in business. We always look for Wind Fury first. We got the Wind Fury, and that's because you get to attack again to get the second adaptation, of course. Um, stealth, I think, is pretty good, because he didn't have the Maelstrom Portal, right? Um, I think we have to try the Stealth. He might get the Maelstrom Portal, but I, I'm 99% certain he, he would have done it last turn if he had it, right? So, I don't... Do we want to go ahead and play the Blood Sail here? Yeah, I suppose so. We're not going to have another pirate to buff it in a while. The only thing is if we... Oh, cool. <laughs> or the stealth Vicious Fledging will just win us the game. There's also uh, there's also that. So let me, play, let me play one more. One more since that game went so insanely fast, right? Like, that was crazy fast. So we'll play one more game. But that's pretty fun. You see the Vicious Fledging in action there. When it hits big, uh, it's absolutely demoralizing for your opponents. It's just game winning in how good it is, so... That's why it's Frothing Berserker 2.0, basically, in that regard. Okay, we got a mage up. So, okay, one drop there. We'll get rid of this expensive stuff. Look for the one drop hit. Okay, two fireflies. Ooze is not going to be relevant against mage, unfortunately, so pretty much a dead draw. I'd rather this be anything else. But uh, still, a lot of guys to play, which is nice. And we can play on Curve, too. We can play this as just a Raptor, right? Like a 3-2 Bloodfin. It's not pingable. Oh, my goodness. Quest Mage, of all things. Interesting. Maybe this will eat some removal that the Vicious Fledgling... Uh, will, will help protect the Vicious Fledgling, right? There's all kinds of lines that, that help in that regard. It's pretty slow. I think we'll just continue playing on curve with threats here. Make the trade, ping. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there's the Frostbolt that might protect the Fledgling. That's exactly what I was talking about. Let's see if it lives. If it dies too, we've also got the Corcoran. So, another three health minion out there that, that uh, the mage may not have an answer for. Wow, that's a good sign, guys. It's exactly what we predicted might happen, right? He used it on the uh, the Junkie three two, and now we get to attack Wind Fury. Um, 
I think since Fireball's a card, that Stealth is actually better here than Health. Um, there shouldn't be a, a four mana way for him to deal with it through Stealth, so I think Stealth is fine. And we'll uh, we'll just play the Corcoran here for for damage. We could play the Corsair, but there's potential that it gets more value later on via Pirate or Weapon synergies, and the Corsair or the uh, Corcoran is just fine. Okay. Well, I can kill that, but that does deny my Fledgling as it stands, except if we have Corcoran Elite number two, and then we get to Fledgling. So let's Fledgling first here. Wind Fury? No. Um, stealth again should be fine. Because, you know, at five mana, uh, he still doesn't have a way to efficiently deal with with a three health minion. It's no flame strike, right? Unless he gets it off Primordial Glyph, but he didn't do that yet. So he wouldn't have the mana necessary to do that this turn either. Kabbalist Tome is very slow when I have 12 damage on board and he's at 18 health with uh, Heroic Strike in hand. So I, I think this is most likely going to be lethal most of the time. That's 8, 11, 12, 16, 17 damage guaranteed. Actually, do I have enough? I don't have enough mana to Heroic Strike and Naga and uh, Nazoth. So I am actually one off unless this gets exactly Wind Fury. Uh, we got Wind Fury, so that's game. We'll just stealth it again for fun, but the game is over, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, he just had a very greedy, slow, slow deck there, and again, couldn't answer the Fledgling. I think you can see why this card is so scary good in uh, this deck, but also, in fact, some others. So there you go, guys. That was my budget pirate warrior deck uh with just a couple on grow cards but they both shined they were both very successful in the list we didn't see any blood tail raider action hardly uh but even the acidic swampoos had some clutch moments too so i hope you saw just how good this deck can be how powerful it is we, we only lost one game and that was pretty much when we were perfectly answered turn after turn so that's not too bad of a loss and uh, ultimately didn't beat the best decks but still beat some solid players and some solid decks i'm sure and uh, we saw the deck work at a fundamental level, which is always nice. And I can guarantee you it is a solid deck to ladder with. So if you at all want to play Pirate Warrior, but you don't have quite enough dust to make the full version, give this one a go. It's a great card. As far as upgrades are concerned, if you're looking for specific upgrades, of course, Patches the Pirate is a great one. South Sea Captain is another perfect option for you. Um, Frothing Berserker is a good card too, which I mentioned numerous times. You can sub out the Fledgling or maybe the Wolf Riders, in fact, for the Frothing Berserker if you have those laying around or a little bit of extra dust. And I even recommend, of course, Leroy Jenkins as well as another finisher. You could take out the Nightblades for a Leroy um, to give you some extra oomph. And then uh, there are probably some other options, too, as far as early curve or middle curve cards are concerned. If you just look at Pirates, right, uh, there are some things. You could run your own Galaka Crawlers, which we saw some people had some success with, but... Beyond that, uh, you could also add in another Mortal Strike, etc. Just look up a full pirate list. It's not that much dust off of this one, so you can build a pretty standard pirate deck with uh, just a few select upgrades here and there. But that said, that's going to do it for me and the budget pirate warrior for Journey to a Girl. So if you have any thoughts, comments, questions, please do leave them in the comments below. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, game on.